How many people here watch the news? When it comes to climate change, it can get quite depressing. It can feel overwhelming. It's easy to feel hopeless. Personally, I watch the news less and less. Still yet to see a good episode. <laughs> like many people growing up,、uh, like many people in Australia, I'm an immigrant. My family and I come from Russia, and contrary to popular belief, a typical Russian diet doesn't actually contain that much meat in it. It's not in every meal, nor is it the central feature of the meal. It's more like a side dish. One of my favorite recipes growing up is called shishlik. It's marinated lamb on a skewer, and it's absolutely delicious. Mum would serve it on special occasions with all the trimmings. And when we moved to Australia, we were quite poor, and red meat being quite expensive, we could only really afford it on special occasions. I really looked forward to those times. My parents sacrificed a lot. And they worked hard, and over time, were able to move out of poverty and join the middle class. We were able to enjoy things like steak more frequently and shishlik. McDonald's was no longer a treat for when I behaved well, but rather a convenient option for when my parents didn't have time to cook. Our story is not that unique. More and more people around the world are moving out of poverty. And joining the middle class, and this is fantastic. However, they're replacing their traditional diets, often low in meat, with a very meat-heavy Western diet. I actually saw this recently. I was back in Moscow, and I was walking down one of the main streets towards Gorky Park, and I saw a big line of people.、And、I thought, "This is curious. This is interesting." As far as I'm not aware, there's no new iPhone out. So what's going on here? So I followed the queue, and sure enough, there was a big golden arches. The meat-heavy Western diet has become a status symbol for the emerging middle class to aspire to. But how much meat is in a typical Western diet? Well, here in Australia, we're definitely on the upper end. We eat 117 kilos of meat every year. It's probably most in, more than your body weight. It's two kilograms a week and over 300 grams a day. According to the Harvard School of Public Health, that's over three times the amount recommended just from a health perspective. And because half of it is red meat, it's more than eight times the amount of red meat recommended. But you're thinking. I'm, I'm sure you're thinking. What does any of this have to do with climate change? Well. To date, our efforts on tackling the climate crisis have largely focused on carbon dioxide emissions. The story goes: as we burn fossil fuels like coal, oil, and gas, we emit carbon dioxide, which warms the climate. So, therefore, the solution that we have been pursuing would be to transition to renewable forms of energy like wind and solar. And don't get me wrong, I support it, and we need to keep fighting that fight. It just doesn't go far enough. There's an elephant in the room that looks suspiciously like a cow. <laughs> here you see the carbon footprint of different types of meat. As you can see here, beef has by far the biggest, followed by lamb. And when you consider that global meat demand is set to double by 2050, according to the UN, this is going to have a massive impact on the climate. I'd like to show you a climate model. Climate models are very powerful pieces of software developed by climate scientists that show us what the future looks like based on the actions we take now or don't take. This one in particular is called the Global Calculator. It was developed by the UK Department of Energy and Climate Change in collaboration with various other organisations around the world. It's constantly been updated with the latest climate science. And is used by governments around the world to test out various climate policies. The scenario I'd like to show you is one where we are very ambitious in our transition to renewable energy, more ambitious, in fact, than the Paris Agreement. But the Western diet continues to spread around the world. Here we see temperature rise over time. Right now we're sitting at 0.8 degrees of warming, and I'm sure we're already feeling it. By the end of the century, we will be looking at between 2.2 and 5.8 degrees of warming, 
far exceeding that safe limit that the leaders of the world agreed to would be the upper limit back in Copenhagen in 2009. Now, historically, we've actually overshot the upper limits of these climate models. This year is a perfect example. According to NASA, the Northern Hemisphere experienced two degrees of warming for the first time in recorded history back in January. So it's happening faster than we ever thought possible. I don't want to be too much of an alarmist, so what does the middle ground look like? Four degrees of warming. Well, aside from all the impacts, which I'm sure you're well aware of, more frequent, more intense droughts, floods, heat waves, the one that keeps me awake at night is sea level rise. Under this scenario, we'll be facing up to 10 meters of sea level rise, inundating many of the, coast, the world's coastal cities. Hundreds of millions of people would be displaced. Right here in this room, we would all be underwater. But what is it about beef and lamb production that contributes to so much to climate change? Well, there's two main factors. The first one, believe it or not, has to do with burps. Cows and sheep are the number one emitters of methane through their burps. And methane is a greenhouse gas that is 86 times as powerful at warming the climate than carbon dioxide. The other aspect is land use. Livestock agriculture occupies 45% of the world's ice-free land. Cattle make up the majority of that land. Right here in Australia, we have the world's biggest cattle station and a creek in southern Australia, which is 23,000 square kilometers. It's more than twice the size of metropolitan Melbourne. When you consider that meat demand is set to double by 2050, this is going to have, are we going to go up to 90%? Where's that additional land going to come from? Well, people in the Middle East have found a way of bringing it out of the sea, although I don't think they're going to be grazing cattle on it. The other way is by cutting down trees. Trees provide us a valuable service. They store a third of the carbon that we emit every year. When we cut them down, they release all of that carbon back into the atmosphere. Sure, sure, palm oil is bad for tropical rainforests, but it only accounts for 10% of their destruction. Beef production accounts for 69% of tropical rainforest destruction. <coughs> World leaders are not factoring this in in their climate negotiations. I was lucky enough to be there at the UN climate talks in Paris recently. And I was very excited at the start. I thought history was going to be made there. But as the talks progressed, I noticed that none of what I've talked about was being discussed, was being even factored in, in the talks or in the final agreement. By the end, I was very disillusioned. We must not wait for world leaders to safeguard our future. We can take the power back. We can reclaim our future with the climatarian diet. Don't worry, it's not vegetarian, it's not vegan. It's considering the carbon impact of the food choices we make. It's a carbon-conscious eating. The only guideline we have for the climatarian diet is cutting back beef and lamb consumption to one standard serving a week which is in line with the health recommendations by the Harvard School of Public Health. A standard serving is the size of my fist, 65 grams. What I propose is not radical, but actually quite reasonable, and considered normal up until only a few decades ago. I'm sure many of you, if not your parents, remember a time when Sunday roast was served on special occasions, just like shishlik. Now, if we were all to move towards a more carbon-conscious way of eating, a climatarian diet, we could potentially have a very different future on our hands. Going back to the climate model, with this being the only variable I change here, we can actually keep climate change to below two degrees. This is what world leaders agree to over the upper safe limit, and we can actually do it. When I first found this out, this gave me hope, and I hope it does for you too. Now, I'm sure many of you are wondering, how can I become a climatarian? Good question. 
Well, there is no one answer. Everyone is starting from a different place. But the aspect I'd like to emphasize is it's all about diversity, diversifying our diets and exploring new options. I often tell my friends, you don't need to be vegetarian to enjoy vegetarian food. I'm not, and some of my favorite recipes are eggplant lasagna, for example, and veggie burgers are just getting better and better. Many people don't believe a meal is a meal unless it has meat in it, and that's okay. I used to think like that. In that case, we just go for the lower carbon option. Go for the chicken parma instead of the steak next time you're at the pub. In terms of red meat, we've got a great alternative right here, although some, of, some people are a bit ambivalent about it. Kangaroo. <laughs> Kangaroo has a 97% smaller carbon footprint than beef. They don't burp methane. You don't need to cut down trees for them to graze. They're native to the environment and they're adapted to the dry climate. Their meat is lean and versatile, can be used in any recipe that beef and lamb are used in. In fact, some of my friends claim that the kangaroo version actually tastes better. It's just an idea. I'm really excited to be telling you about a new challenge we're launching very soon, which will come with a smartphone app. It's called the Climatarian Challenge. It's a month-long challenge where you start the month with 8,000 carbon points which is equivalent to the carbon budget if we were to move towards a safe climate, which I hope you all want to do. Over the course of the month, you basically put in what kind of meat you had, approximately how big it was, and it subtracts the carbon footprint of that meal. It's going to be a fun challenge and compete with your friends and family. We must not wait for world leaders to safeguard our future. We must take the power back and reclaim our future with the climatarian diet. Let's do this together, and let's start now. Thank you. <laughs>